with Pastor Joseph, Joseh here in the Trinity, Trinity Channel. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I pray that you're glad. And uh, with God's help, <laughs> with God's help, we'll have some mercy from the Lord this evening as the nation is on the eve of electing a new president uh, as well as other uh, officials in our Senate and House of Representatives, uh, governors and different officers throughout the nation. God have mercy on America. Indeed, tonight's subject matter is Hillary or Muhammad, who is worse for America? Hillary or Muhammad? We say, I thought it was Hillary or Trump. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, yes, indeed. But if Hillary wins the election, God forbid, but certainly it could happen, then uh, what are we going to be looking forward to as far as Christians? Uh, and as a matter of fact, if we study what Hillary Clinton uh, is intimating and doing or has done, it seems to look more and more like Islam and Muhammad when it comes to freedom of speech and particularly freedom of religion. And indeed, uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Hussein Obama have made a point of uh, making a shift after the massacre the Muslim massacre of, uh, of Christians and others at Fort Hood uh, back uh, several years back, right? Uh, indeed. I forget what year was that, 2009, I believe. Nevertheless, uh, Barack Hussein Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, made a shift to no longer say freedom of religion, as it says in the First Amendment to our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, but to use the words freedom of worship, freedom of worship being a, a much smaller freedom, which uh, is, is basically talking about uh, you can worship who you want in your little church, but don't you share your religion outside of that. All right, and what does that talk about? Well, we're looking at that. We're going to be taking your calls, 248-416-1300. First of all, I want to look at the idea of Islam, freedom in Islam. Um, freedom doesn't seem to be uh, at the top of the list of virtues of the religion of Islam. As a matter of fact, we have a couple of pictures, a couple of slides that we want to show of Muslims holding up signs in different rallies. Uh, this is what this Muslim in the UK thinks of freedom. Freedom, go to hell. And uh, there's many other signs like it. We have another picture, I think, of some Muslims in Indonesia. Uh, freedom of expression, go to hell. So this is what Muslims around the world think of uh, freedom and freedom of expression that we have in the United States of America and, of course, freedom of religion. And so this is very important. This is what Muslims are saying around the world. You know, they burn embassies, they kill people, they kill uh, innocent people like nuns and priests and others and, and just burn up, blow up, go crazy, become rabid. If anyone says anything about Muhammad, uh, you know, you would think that Muhammad was their God. You can talk about Allah, but the big deal is don't talk about Muhammad no matter what. Well, what we have is, uh, in the religion of Islam, there are reasons that uh, you are to be silenced. If you're, if you're speaking against Muhammad or against Islam, you are to be silenced. There's no freedom of speech. So, for example, if I was to go on a street corner in, uh, in Saudi Arabia someplace and begin preaching the gospel and begin saying that, you know, hey, Muhammad was not a true prophet of God. Muhammad was uh, demon-possessed by his own admission. Muhammad uh, really was, was a pedophile by a modern definition, marrying a six-year-old, waiting till she was nine, Aisha, to uh, consummate the marriage. And to say things that would seem somehow derogatory, even though they're truth, uh, at least according to Muslim sources, of Muhammad and Islam, uh, I would not only be uh, jailed if, if, if uh, the police could save me from the mob that would try to kill me, but there or Pakistan or other places, I'd be mobbed, I'd be attacked physically, maybe beaten in the streets. No freedom of speech in Islamic nations. Now, uh, some nations have a little bit more than others, and that's because those nations who uh, do not adhere so closely to Sharia law like Egypt, now under uh, Sisi, and before under Mubarak, there is more freedom of expression. The Islamic nations that uh, adhere closer to Sharia law, of course, under ISIS and Afghanistan and Somalia and these places, there's no freedom of speech whatsoever, nor freedom of religion, really. And so why is that? Well, Islam is very clear. Uh, there's no freedom 
uh, in, in the world for people to speak against Islam. Now, we often quote the Quran, and we'll be doing that in just a moment, also Hadith, but also uh, we talk about Sharia. Sharia is uh, Islamic law, and uh, one of the most famous and uh, used Sharia law books in the world, in the religion of Islam, is the Reliance of the Traveler. And uh, we have some quotes from this uh, Islamic work of scholarship. It's a medieval work, actually, but still used today. And uh, this work gives Islamic scholars rulings on certain issues. For example, freedom of uh, saying things that are not so positive or encouraging about Islam and about Muhammad. So we're going to take a look at some of that right now, along with uh, what Muhammad did, along with verses from the Quran, along with um, Hadith, and uh, and see what Muhammad actually did. You know, Muhammad killed at least 10 poets. That's right, poets. Why? He didn't like their poetry. He didn't rhyme. No, because uh, their poetry was somehow not complimentary of him. In some cases, maybe it was deriding him. In other cases, it was just not for him or Islam. So he ordered their assassinations. So remember, in, in the Quran, in, in, uh, you find in chapter 33 that you are supposed to follow the example of Muhammad. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of Sunni Islam and the Sunnah is that uh, in Muhammad you find supposedly this excellent exemplar. Uh, he is the one to whom everyone is supposed to look to see that model of conduct. And so Muhammad, when he was um, reviled or made fun of, or he felt like he was being slighted by the poets, then uh, he had him assassinated, killed. Whether they were a hundred-year-old man, whether it was a woman, it made no difference to Muhammad. We see in the Quran in Surah Al-Azab, Surah 33, verse 21, you have indeed in the Messenger of Allah a beautiful pattern of conduct, in parentheses, in Yusuf Ali, for anyone whose hope is in Allah and in the final day, and who engages much in the praise of Allah. So, Muhammad's supposed to be the pattern. Well, what does Muhammad do with people who criticize him? He kills them. <laughs> and even allows people to lie, cheat, deceive, whatever they need to do, to kill folks that simply criticize Islam. Not, not physically fight, just criticize Islam. Interestingly enough, uh, Barack Hussein Obama, Hillary Clinton, and others uh, would like to criminalize speech that would speak somehow uh, irreverently about Islam, or, for that matter, about homosexuality. That's interesting. I wonder if uh, Hillary Clinton gets in, if she criminalizes speech about homosexuality, if she and her Department of Justice, God forbid, will enforce uh, that on Muslims who say that homosexuality is a sin and wrong and homosexuals should be killed. Because certainly they don't always say it, but they do it. In ISIS, in Mosul, they've been throwing homosexuals, anyone they find, off the highest building uh, and making a public spectacle of it, because after all, this is the teachings of the religion of Islam. All right, so we have this idea then that uh, what did Muhammad do? Muhammad killed. Muhammad ordered those to be killed. And not just Muhammad, by the way. Let's take a look at a few uh, Quranic verses. Not just Muhammad. Allah, Allah supposedly, now I say supposedly, orders these people killed. Let's take a look in, in the Quran. We find in, uh, in chapter 9, first of all, let's look at chapter 9. Uh, we have this idea in chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. 9, 11, isn't that interesting? Um, there's this idea in 9, 11 and following up through verse 14 or so, that is referring to apostates. Now, apostates or those, uh, yeah, those essentially who leave Islam. Well, freedom of religion, can a Muslim who becomes a Muslim, someone who becomes a Muslim, can he leave Islam? Does he have the freedom to choose? Well, not in Islam, not at all. As a matter of fact, it says, uh, verse 11 of chapter 9, Surah al tawbah in the Quran, um, if they repent, that is, these Muslims who have left the religion or made fun of it, if they repent and establish regular prayers, that means salat, and practice regular charity, zakat, they are your brethren in faith. Do we explain the signs in detail for those who are So in other words, those who left Islam, give them a chance to repent. If they repent and come back and become Muslims, leave them alone. But, verse 12 of Surah 9, but if they violate their oaths after their covenant and taunt you for your faith, Fight ye the chiefs of unfaith, for their oaths are nothing to them, that they uh, must thus must be restrained. 
And then verse 13, Allah says, Will you not fight people who violated their oaths and plotted to expel the messenger? Notice it doesn't say expel them, it just says plotted to expel them. Will you not fight them and, and took aggress to aggression by being the first to assault you? It goes on, verse 14, fight them and Allah will punish them by your hands. Cover them with shame, help you to have victory over them and heal the breasts of believers. You see, uh, so this is the idea. So there's no freedom in Islam. There's no freedom to leave the religion of Islam. Islam is called uh, the spiritual roach motel. You know, uh, people check in, and Muslims check in, but they don't check out. Well, anyways, uh, there's something to that. But there's also some uh, other passages here. We're in 9, uh, 11 through 14, we mentioned. But let's take a look at, uh, at Surah 9, verse 61. 9, verse 61. Now, Muhammad did not like to be annoyed, okay? Now, you know, I mean, nobody likes to be annoyed, so, you know, give the man a break, right? Well, well, let's take a look. Surah 9, chapter 9 of Surah October, verse 61. He has this verse. Among those them are men who molest the prophet and say, he is all ear. Uh, say, he listens to what is best for you. He believes in Allah, has faith in the believers, and is a mercy to those of you who believe. But those who molest the prophet will have a grievous penalty. So those who say he is all ear, uh, the idea being that they're making fun of him. They're making fun of him, says, oh, he listens to, to everybody. In other words, you know, he's, make, he's making up these revelations and he's just uh, copying it from other people, this, that, and the other thing. So these are people who molest the prophet and uh, the prophet, or Allah says, don't molest the prophet. If you do, there will be a grievous penalty that comes upon you. Uh, interestingly enough, on that note, if you turn over to uh, 973, Allah instructs his prophet, O prophet, Ya Yuha al-Nabi, Jahada al kufa O prophet, strive hard, actually, you know, fight jihad, fight jihad, against the unbelievers and the monafikin, the hypocrites, and be firm against them. Their abode is hell, an evil refuge indeed. And, and these hypocrites are the ones who have essentially turned away from Islam. And you're not supposed to annoy the messenger, but just a couple more passages in, in, in the Quran to prove this point. Back to uh, chapter 33. Chapter 33. There's a lot of stuff up in chapter 33 uh, about Muhammad and, and his person and his household and his women. And then, of course, we mentioned the idea that 3321, you have indeed a, pa a mess, a, a pattern, the sunnah, but um, also the fact that Allah prays on Muhammad and, and the angels pray on Muhammad, not blessing. Very strange. Anyways, in chapter 33, verse 53, we find uh, an interesting uh, passages uh, about Muhammad being annoyed. <laughs> and what should you do with people who annoy Muhammad? Well, chapter 33, Surah Al-Azab, verse 53. Oh, you who believe, enter not the prophet's houses until leave is given you, till you have permission. Um, and it, it says, you know, such behavior annoys the prophet. He is ashamed to dismiss you, but Allah is not ashamed to tell you the truth. <laughs> So Muhammad is, you know, he, he's ashamed. He doesn't want to tell you to leave. He wants to be hospitable. But Allah, he's not ashamed to tell you, hey, you're annoying the prophet. Don't do that. All right, now we continue to watch. It says, uh, and, and then he goes on to say, and when ye ask his ladies for anything you want, ask them from before a screen. And so there's this issue uh, in, the, in the hadith and in the seerah that, you know, the, the visitors would come over to Muhammad companions and they would see some of his wives in various state of undress and this was really bothering Muhammad so they had this curtain and uh, and then he goes on and he says um, uh, further on if you continue to read you see that there are more verses look at verse 57 
Uh, now remember, verse 56, interesting, 3356 is this strange verse. You know, Muslims, these, uh, these Muslims who, who follow their religion, uh, every time they, they uh, say the name of Muhammad, they say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, sometimes they'll say it under their breath, or sometimes they're trying to show out, and they'll make a big point of saying it and make you wait. And so every time they say Muhammad, you know, and in English sometimes they say, peace and blessings be upon him, or peace be upon him. But really that's not what the Quran says. The Quran says... Uh, Allah and his angels pray on the Prophet. Now, son of a gun, Yusuf Ali, of course, he, he mistranslates it because it says, In Allah wa malakatahu yusaloon Allah al nabi That's what it says in Arabic. In Allah wa malakatahu, Allah and his angels, yusaloon, yusaloon. What's your saloon? That's not going to a saloon in the Wild West, folks. That's talking about they pray. The word salli or salah, the noun form, salli, your saloon, they pray on Muhammad. This is very strange. You know, Allah is praying. Who do Allah pray to? Our God doesn't pray to anyone. We pray to him. But anyhow, the very next verse after that is strange because, so, so we're going to exalt Muhammad really above Allah. Because Allah prays on Muhammad. But then verse 57, those who annoy Allah and his messenger, Allah has cursed them in this world and in the hereafter and has prepared for them a humiliating punishment. So again, there's this idea. Don't annoy the prophet. Don't annoy the prophet. Don't annoy Muhammad. Allah's going to be mad at you. And, uh, and there is this grievous or humiliating punishment and chastisement that's going to come upon you if you do that. Now remember, back in Surah 9, uh, verse 61, uh, Allah is telling his followers, Surah Muhammad, that, you know, you, you need to, to fight the hypocrites. And, you know, if, if they don't repent, you need to fight them uh, in verse 61. They're going to have a grievous penalty, it actually says in verse 61. And then in, uh, in verse 73... It talks, uh, Allah commands Muhammad specifically to fight physical jihad against the unbelievers and the hypocrites. And then in Surah 9, verse 123, it goes a step further and it says, not only Muhammad, but, Ya ayyuha alladhina ammanu, kittalu. Oh, you who believe. Uh, the son of a gun, Yusuf Ali, says fight, but it really should be kill. Kill the unbelievers who gird about you. Yes, it does say uh, qatilu, so qatilu with the alif, which is fighting to kill. It's fighting mortal combat, fighting war to kill them. But anyways, fight the unbelievers who gird about you. Let them find firmness in you and know that Allah is with those who fear him. And so the idea is, uh, these are people, it says, who gird about you. Well, this idea, there are people around... Uh, uh, m Muslims, those who are near to you, but there are supposedly those who are hypocritical, those who've left the faith, or those who speak ill of Islam. Let's take a look now, not just at what Pastor Joseph says, but what do Islamic scholars say uh, in the Reliance of the Traveler? It says, um, it says, according to the Reliance of Traveler for Muslims, acts that entail leaving Islam, known as apostasy or ridda, are the ugliest forms of unbelief and the worst. When a person who has reached puberty is sane and voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed. Repentance is accepted so that he is not killed. But if he refuses to repent, then the caliph or representative may execute him without indemnity or expiation for killing him. Now, for our purposes, these eight acts mean that a Muslim has apostatized. What is apostasy according to uh, Sharia? To speak words that imply unbelief, such as Allah is one of the three. Or, I am Allah. A mitigating circumstance on such blasphemy if his, a man's tongue runs away with him or if he's intoxicated. Reviling Allah or his messenger. So, if you revile Allah or his messenger, you say something bad about it, it's essentially you've been you've apostatized. But if you've apostatized, uh, Allah says in the Quran, you should kill them. You should fight these hypocrites. You should kill them. Muhammad, you should kill them. Uh, Surah 9, verse 123, all Muslims are required and, and commanded to kill them. And we'll look at some more verses. I think Surah 486, the Hadith is very clear. Muhammad in Sahih Bukhari is told, says, if a man changes his religion, go and kill him. We'll look at that in just a minute. Also, being sarcastic about Allah's name, his command, his interdiction, his promise, or his threat. 
Uh, and then denying any verse of the Quran or anything which by scholarly consensus belongs to it or to add a verse that does not belong to it or holding that any of Allah's messengers are, or prophets are liars or to deny their being sent. So we do that all the time. Uh, you know, hey, Muhammad, we do not believe is a true prophet of God. Well, reviling the religion of Islam, being sarcastic about any ruling of the sacred law, denying that Allah intended the prophet's message to be the religion followed by the entire world. Now, this is a great article from answering-islam.org by uh, James Arlinson. These rules are broad and ambiguous, he says. Therefore, they can shut down any criticism of Muhammad, Islam, or the Quran. It is no wonder that critical investigation of the truth claims of Islam and the violence and immorality in Muhammad's life in the Quran can never prevail in Islamic lands when the sword of Muhammad hangs over the scholar's head. Isn't that something? The Enlightenment that covered the West and that produced critical scholarship and advanced technology has bypassed the Islamic world, and this is tragic and the cause of many troubles between the West and Islam. Non-Muslims living under Islamic rule are not allowed to do the following. Page 609 of Reliance of the Travel, Islamic scholarship here. They cannot commit adultery with a Muslim woman or marry her. They cannot conceal spies of hostile forces. And then they cannot lead a Muslim away from Islam. No evangelization of Muslims allowed. So no freedom of speech there. And they cannot mention something impermissible about Allah, the Prophet, or Islam. There you go. No freedom of speech in Islam. Well, that's exactly what Hillary Clinton says. You know, did you vote for Hillary Clinton? God forbid. God forbid. But if you did, you're voting for essentially what Muhammad says. You're voting for Sharia law. You're, you know, because Hillary Clinton said, hey, you can't say anything about Islam. You remember Benghazi? You know, Hillary Clinton killed our ambassador. Essentially, she killed him, didn't she? She allowed him to be killed. And the others in the embassy, she could have stopped it. Uh, and then, you know, she knew who it was. She knew why it was. And you know what she did? She blames it on an Egyptian Christian. An uh, Egyptian Christian guy who makes this, this uh, YouTube video, this second-rate video, Nakula Basali. Uh, <laughs> we have a picture of him, actually. Uh, because uh, she did everything. She, she made the police go and, uh, and and arrest the guy. If we have a picture that I want to show it, maybe it'll strike in your memory. But remember, she tried to get out of it. She caused our ambassador to be killed. She caused those men to be killed in Benghazi. It's her fault and our nation's fault and Obama. And, and guess what? She blames it on this guy. We'll see the picture hopefully in just a minute when our technicians can bring it up. But anyways... Uh, it will remind you of, of who that is. And so this is the thing. And then she, she, you know what she wanted to do? And other liberal lawmakers, we need to put a law through real quick that makes it against the law to say anything bad about Islam or the Quran. Because who knows, you know, they might come and kill us. Or they might kill another ambassador or whatever else. God forbid. What's the difference between Muhammad and Hillary Clinton in this regard? I don't think there's much. What does it say? It says the first rule. Well, these rules, the third and fourth rules that we just mentioned, stifle and restrict free speech and freedom of religion. Of course they do. And then it goes on to say, uh, the schools uh, of law, of Sharia law, besides Shafi, the translator of Abu Dawood's hadith collection, Ahmed Hassan, informs us, it is unanimously agreed that if a Muslim abuses or insults the prophet, he should be killed. How's that for freedom of speech? There is a difference of opinion of killing a non-Muslim. According to al-Shafi, he should be killed. Abu Hanifa is of the opinion that he should not be killed. And Malik maintains that he should be killed, except that he embraces Islam. So if, if you're a Christian or an atheist or a Jew or whoever, anything but a, a practicing Sunni Muslim, then uh, if you say anything bad about Muhammad, Muhammad or Islam, where specifically it says if a Muslim abuses, the insults the Prophet. So it's talking specifically about the Prophet, not even Allah or the Quran or the religion. The Prophet, the idol of Islam, Muhammad, the one who calls himself the praised one. So if you say anything about him, uh, you're going to be killed. Unless you want to become a Muslim and then, hey, we won't kill you after all. Maybe we'll save that later. But, you know, this is, this is Sharia. This is what Islamic law tells us. And uh, it goes on to say, but Hassan records his opinion on a hadith that shows a Jewish woman being killed 
See Hadith number 4349 Abu Dawood above. This strangulation of the Jewish woman shows that even if a Jew or a non-Muslim abuses the Prophet, he will be killed. This includes Christians as well. Hassan then lists some jurists who hold this opinion. Note 3800. Death for insults is excessive and excess is never just. And so, you know, there's, there's a little bit of difference in opinion, but the prevailing opinion is that you should kill anyone who insults Muhammad. Now, this is uh, very different, of course, from Christianity, but let me just mention to you some names. There are some, remember Theo Van Gogh in, in uh, Holland? He was killed because he made a movie that uh, somehow uh, did not... Uh, encourage uh, good feelings about Muhammad. Uh, he was killed by a Muslim because of that. And also you remember, of course, the satanic verses and Salman Rushdie and the fatwa on his head. But here's the name of individuals who Muhammad himself ordered to be assassinated. Uh, Al-Nadir bin Al-Harif. Uh, this is the one who uh, said, by God, Muhammad cannot tell a better story than I. Muhammad didn't like that at all. So Muhammad had him killed. Indeed, uh, you find in the Quran, it seems that referring to uh, Al-Nadir's harassment of Muhammad, some scholars believe that this is uh, found in Surah 83, verse 13 of the Quran, when it says, when our revelations are recited to him, he says, ancient fables. No, indeed, their hearts are encrusted with what they have done. No, indeed, on that day, they will be screened off from their Lord. They will burn in hell, and they will be told, this is what you call a lie. We find that Muhammad's revenge was not long in coming, and uh, Muhammad uh, al-Nadir uh, was taken prisoner in the Battle of Badr, and he and one other uh, were the only ones who were not allowed to go free, but were uh, beheaded and killed. Also, and then you find that in Ibn Ishaq, uh, and you can find uh, this, this story to be uh, very clear. Also, Uqba bin Abu Mu'ayt, uh, he also was captured and beheaded because he had harassed and mocked Muhammad in Mecca. Asma bin Marwan, uh, Asma was a poetess. She was a woman who belonged to the tribe of the Medinan pagans. And uh, she uh, had composed a poem blaming the Medinan pagans for obeying a stranger, Muhammad, and for not taking the initiative to attack him by surprise. So then Allah's messenger, Muhammad, says, who will rid me of Marwan's daughter? And a member of her husband's tribe volunteered, crept into her house that night. She had five children. The youngest was sleeping at her breast. The assassin gently removed the child, drew his sword, and plunged it into her, killing her in her sleep. Another assassination of a woman by Muhammad, ordered by Muhammad. Why? Because she said, did a poem, she wrote a poem that wasn't so nice about Muhammad. Hey, this is what they want to do in America. I don't know if Hillary is going to come with her sword, but, but maybe the sword of the law. They want to put us in jail. They want to put us in jail and criminalize speaking truth. And the truth is, folks, that Muhammad is not the prophet of God. Jesus is. Muhammad's not the son of God. Jesus is. Muhammad did not write, raise from the dead. Jesus did. Muhammad didn't die on a cross for your sins. Jesus did. Muhammad's not coming back to judge the world. Jesus will. And we need to be ready for that. This is the training channel. Pastor Joseph here at the Cross and the Crescent. We're going to take a break in just a moment. Before we do, I want to remind you that uh, we depend upon your prayers and your financial support to continue producing quality programs. We pray like this one, and I pray that you are being blessed. I want to hear from you, 248-416-1300 after the break, especially you viewers in uh, North Carolina watching by uh, Channel 14.6 TV, but all around the world. We know we have viewers, and we thank God for you. Please pray for us. ABN, the Trinity Channel, is in the midst of a fundraiser right now. And uh, we depend upon your generosity and God's spirit moving upon your hearts to keep our programs uh, on the air. The only programs in the world, in the English language, that continue to expose the religion of Islam while exalting Christ Jesus alone as the way of salvation. I'm Pastor Joseph here with the Cross and the Crescent, and we've got a break now. and We'll be right back after uh, these messages. We thank God for the impact that both AVN and the Trinity Channel are making in the world today. For the past 10 years, 
we have expanded to over five continents. Australia, the Middle East, North America, and parts of Africa. And we continue to grow. In response to our expansion, we have received calls to our live shows on a daily basis from different countries, such as Australia, the USA, Canada. Yes. Yes. Iraq. Egypt. Germany. Lebanon. Sudan. Iran. Jordan. Syria. France. Algeria Saudi Arabia Sweden والأشخاص اللي يدعون والأخ أيمن أيضا بأنه الإسلام قوي وأن العالم مليار ونص مراكو الدكتور سامي يعمل حلقة السيد القناني يامن ماشيين بشرع البشر وليس بشرع الله هؤلاء اللي سموا أنفسهم علماء هذو القرناء our ministry has grown, but we want to continue to grow until we are fully worldwide. Please support this channel to make this dream into a reality. Call the numbers on your screen to donate or visit our website at trinitychannel.com and avnset.com. Praise the Lord. Welcome back to the Cross and Crescent here with Pastor Joseph and the Trinity Channel. I thank God for you, dear viewers. And here we are looking at our message tonight, uh, the idea Hillary or Muhammad, who is worse for America? Well, I just was told that um, it looks like uh, Trump's in the lead with 19 electoral votes over Hillary, uh, who has three. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a good start, but it's just a start. So let's be praying. Christians everywhere, we need to be praying. Praying, yes, because Hillary Clinton, uh, if she gets in, uh, you know, Huma Abedin and all of these uh, Muslim Brotherhood operatives that work in the uh, White House <laughs> and and uh, under Hillary Clinton and all these others, we got you know bad things coming. I mean, Hillary Clinton puts uh, you know Al Qaeda in Libya in power. Hillary Clinton puts uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in power in Egypt. Uh, you know, I mean, we got we got trouble right here in River City. That's right. It it, it starts with C. It rhymes with, what is it? It starts with T. Trouble starts with T. It rhymes with C. That stands for Clinton. Uh, yeah, if you don't know that one, go check out the Music Man on YouTube. Anyways, all right, so Muhammad, anybody who, who criticized him, even wrote a poem about it, made fun of him, psh, kill him, kill him. Well, this is essentially what Hillary Clinton wants to do. Anyone who's going to say anything bad about Islam, let's just, uh, let's put them in jail, let's criminalize them, whatever else. Let's, let's stop freedom of speech, let's stop freedom of religion. You've got Abu Afaq, Muhammad had killed Kab uh, bin al-Ashraf, 
Also, we have uh, Ibn uh, Sunayana, the one-eyed Bedouin, that he uh, he applauded um, his his uh, followers. Uh, murder of the man on the spot for saying he wouldn't become a Muslim. Also a close call for Abdullah bin Saad, one of Abdullah bin Khattal's two singing girls murdered right there at the Kaaba. Close call for Kaab bin Zuhair uh, because, you know, th these are, th there's others, there's many others who, who he killed. But let's finally, before we get to Christianity and what does it truly say, the Bible about freedom and, uh, and how we have freedom in Christ. We have this idea uh, that there's these uh, fatwas, and there are these places on the on the uh, the internet that Muslims around the world ask questions of these scholars. Well, one of the most uh, famous one is uh, is this uh, scholar in Saudi Arabia and uh, Sheikh Mohammed Salah Al Munajid. And so here's some questions about these topics of of voting and all of that and freedom. Uh, to follow the democratic and republican uh, processes uh, that we have in the West. And uh, here's a, a famous Muslim scholar's rulings on these issues. It says, the scholar of the Standing Committee for Issuing Fatwas were asked, is it permissible to vote in elections and nominate people for them? Please note that our country is ruled according to something other than that which Allah revealed. They replied, it is not permissible for a Muslim to nominate himself in the hope that he can become part of a system which rules according to something other than that which Allah has revealed and operates according to the something other than Sharia of Islam. It is not permissible for a Muslim to vote for him or for anyone else who will work in that government unless the one who nominates himself or those who vote for him hope that by getting involved in that they will be able to change the system to one that operates according to the Sharia of Islam. That's what Hillary Clinton wants to do. That's what Homa Abedin wants to do. Hey, th this is exactly what the scholarly opinion of, of Muslims is. No, you shouldn't vote. You shouldn't get involved in politics unless you think you have an opportunity to change the system. That's right. That's exactly what it says. If you can change the system to one that cooperates, that operates according to the Sharia of Islam, and they are using this as a means to overcome the system of government, that's revolution, that's treasonous talk, that's what Muslims want to do, and unfortunately the Democratic Party of Barack Hussein Obama and Hillary Clinton, especially if she gets elected, but already a Secretary of State, has done year after year after year, tried to allow Sharia law and Muslims to overcome, infiltrate, and overcome. And that's why they want all these immigrants to come in. You know, hey, if, if, if someone comes in and they're an upstanding citizen, all that kind of stuff, it's one thing, but they want all these people to come in uh, to change our government, to change our land. Oh, God help us. God help us. It's exactly what Islamic scholars are saying. It's exactly what Hillary Clinton wants. Indeed. Another question. Is it permissible for Muslims to vote for kafirs who seem to be less evil? So, is it permissible? So, so like a Muslim in America, well, uh, Hillary Clinton claims to be a United Methodist, for whatever that means. Uh, Trump claims to be a Presbyterian. He's probably in the PCUSA church, a very liberal Presbyterian church, whatever that means. Okay, anyway, so they both claim to be Christians. So a Muslim would call both of them kafirs. They're not believers. So they're saying, can we vote for either one of them? Because after all, you know, they're unbelievers. So the answer is, it is uh, not permissible for a Muslim to vote for him or for anyone else uh, who will work in that uh, government? I'm sorry. It says um, it says the matter of rulings differ according to different circumstances in different times and places. There is no absolute ruling that covers all situations, both real and hypothetical. In some cases, it is wrong to vote, such as when the matter will have no effect on Muslims, or when the Muslims have no effect on the outcome of the vote. And then it says uh, it may be the case that the interest of Islam require Muslims to vote so as to ward off the greater evil and reduce harmful effects, such as where two candidates may be non-Muslims, but one of them is less hostile towards Muslims than the other. Well, that's how Muslims view Trump as hostile against them, even though I don't think that's the case. And Clinton is less hostile. So in other words, you should vote for Clinton as a Muslim. Uh, but I've told you why you shouldn't, by the way. But anyways, and Muslims' votes will have an impact on the outcome of the election. In such cases, there's nothing wrong with Muslims casting their votes in favor of the less evil candidate. <laughs> so in other words... Uh, what it's basically saying is, uh, 
It says, no one should imagine that anyone who says it is okay to vote is thereby expressing approval or support for the kufr. So in other words, hey, we want you to vote for Clinton. It doesn't mean that we support her, that we support she's an unbeliever, that we don't have any love for her, we could care less for her. But then why would you say she could, you could vote for her? Well, here it is. It is done in the interest of Muslims not out of love for the Kufar and its people. The Muslims rejoiced when the Romans defeated the Persians, as did the Muslims in Abyssinia when the Negus defeated those who had challenged his authority. This is well known from history. Whoever wants to be on the safe side and abstain from voting is allowed to do so. Uh, so, you know, here it is. I mean, freedom, you're not supposed to even uh, be involved in a democratic process or Republican process. You shouldn't vote at all unless you think, hey, you can vote for someone who's going to somehow uh, help the Muslims. You don't care if anything for them. As a matter of fact, you hate them and wish they go to hell, both Clinton and Trump. But if Clinton can allow you to uh, somehow exist in the government and overchange it and be treasonous and have a revolution and one day bring Sharia law into the land, then, hey, maybe you ought to support the Democratic Party, even though it, it's for homosexuality, even though it's for abortion, even though it's for all of these things that it supposedly – uh, Islam isn't for, but uh, anyways, this is the uh, capricious nature of the religion of Islam. Freedom, freedom. Muhammad and Clinton have apparently about the same uh, views on this idea of freedom. Well, what about, uh, oh, one more thing. Remember, the freedom to choose your religion, the freedom to change your religion. The Quran says in chapter 4, verse 89, they wish that you should reject faith as they rejected faith, and then you would be equal. Therefore, turn not your backs, turn, take not friends from them until they immigrate in the way of God. Then if they turn their backs, take them and slay them wherever you find them. Take not to yourselves any one of them as a friend or a helper. And we already mentioned Surah 9, verse 11 through 12. We also know the Hadith. The Hadith is very clear. Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 52, number 260. The Prophet said, if anybody changes his religion, kill him him. And again, Sahih al-Bukhari, volume uh, 80, number 8337, it says Allah's apostle never killed anyone except in one of the following three cases. And one of them is uh, a man who fought against Allah and his apostle and deserted Islam and became an apostate. So there's no freedom to leave Islam. Well, why? So the religion should be so wonderful and so powerful and so, if it's true that nobody wants to leave it. And, and if they leave it, you don't have to worry about it. That's how Christianity is, by the way. We don't force people to become Christians. We give them the gospel. We allow them to choose, you see. And uh, if someone's a Christian, he wants to leave the religion. That doesn't make us happy. We're not pleased. However, praise God, uh, you know, we will pray for them. Uh, we have a message that uh, Florida so far is 60% in favor of Donald Trump. That's a good thing. We need to keep praying. Hillary Clinton is a huge problem. And uh, one of the big problems with Hillary Clinton is uh, it seems to me that she's pulling for the very same side as Islam is, which is ultimately Antichrist, who is a liar, but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ and really gives him uh, all of the authority of his deity and his rights. It is Christ who says, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Hillary Clinton uh, wants us to, to love uh, our neighbors uh, and, and all of that good stuff. But when it comes down to uh, Christians having their rights to uh, share their, their beliefs in the public square uh, or even to say, hey, we don't believe in Islam or Islam is not true or look at these things that Muhammad did according to Islam. No, you can't do that. No, 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 not at all. You know, it's interesting. Again, in the Bible, we have this passage, you know, on the Liberty Bell in, in uh, Philadelphia. On that liberty bell that's cracked, it used to be such a wonderful symbol of liberty in America, and still is, but uh, unfortunately, our children are getting away from being taught anything true about the liberty that we have and how it is founded in the Bible. What is on the liberty bell? A verse from the Quran? Certainly not. You saw what Muslims think of freedom, say freedom go to hell. It's actually a verse from the Bible. It's Leviticus uh, chapter 25, verse 10, which says, uh, you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. There it is on the Liberty Bell. And, uh, and that's because the true religion of God is a religion of freedom, a religion of liberty. You see, and that's the whole message of the gospel in our last 15 minutes of our program. It's freedom. What do you mean freedom? Well, the ultimate freedom is the freedom of fear of judgment of God. Because our sins judge us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Muslims, you've sinned. You know it. 
Are you sure that God's going to uh, save you and let you into heaven? There's a fear there. There's, a, there's an anxiety. You don't know. Muslims, if you ask them if they're going to be saved, they say, Inshallah, if it's the will of Allah, we hope so. We pray. They never say, oh, yes, absolutely, definitely, very seldom, unless it's a debate and then they're trying to make a point. And so the point is, as Christians, we can say, yes, absolutely, I know for sure I'm going to go to heaven. Not because of, of how good I am. I'm not good enough to go to heaven. Not because I don't have sins. I have sins like everyone else but because how good Jesus is, because Jesus died on the cross for me. You see, it's a beautiful thing. Let's look at a few passages before the end of our program tonight. If you turn to the Gospel of Romans, you find what true freedom is. See, the freedom that we enjoy in the West, in Europe, and especially in the United States of America, because unfortunately Europe is becoming uh, uh, dimified, if you will. It's, it's bowing the knee to Sharia law. But in Romans chapter 6, talking about the gospel, talking about how Christians are free. And if you're a Muslim tonight, you can be free too. How do you get free? Well, here it is in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we being buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. This is beautiful. Romans 6 verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer longer be slaves of sin. This idea of being a slave of Allah. Well, it is in Christianity, but really we're set free to serve him. In Islam, you are a slave. For verse 7, he who died has been freed from sin. Oh, there's that language. You see, a dead man doesn't sin, does he? Well, we who have been born again, we have died to sin, and therefore we are freed from the power of sin. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 24, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. For the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so we have died. To be born again, you have to die. It says, for he, Romans 6, verse 7, for he who died has been freed from sin. That's someone who's been born again, a Christian. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God and Christ Jesus our Lord. And then finally, in verses 18 through 22 in Romans 6, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves and uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your body or members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in those things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But here it is, verse 22. But now... Have having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then we find in Romans 8 verses 1 and 2, we find this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 2 of Romans 8. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Praise the Lord. has made me free from the law of sin and death. We're free from it. Muslims, you're not yet free because Muhammad didn't overcome death. How could you overcome death? Muhammad's bones and body is decayed in, in the grave in Medina. But Jesus, up from the grave, he arose. With a mighty triumph of his foes, hallelujah, he arose a victor from the dark domain. <laughs> I could just sing on and on and on, praise God forevermore, because Christ arose, Christ has defeated hell, death, yes, Satan, sin, and the grave, and he is free, he is free from that bondage, and so too all of us who are believers, we're born again, if we, are, if we are born again, we have no condemnation, for we were in Christ Jesus, we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, now that's freedom. 
That's freedom. Let me take you to one more place while we're looking here. John chapter 8. The Gospel of John chapter 8. You know, I'm so glad you all have been watching tonight. I pray that you've been blessed by the Trinity Channel. So many programs uh, exposing uh, false religions, but Islam in particular, exalting Jesus Christ. And tonight, talking about the idea of Muhammad and Hillary. Uh, the liberal left in America, not much different from radical Islam when it comes to ideas of freedom of speech, freedom of religion and worship. I mean, they want to curtail things. They want to keep us from saying anything that's true if it somehow offends them or offends Muslims or whatever else. God forbid, this is exactly what Muhammad said. But in John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, we find this beautiful passage in verse 31 and following. It says, Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I love this, this passage. It's uh, it's so it's so wonderful. Even in the Arabic, in the Arabic Bible, wa ta'arafun al haq wa al haqu yuhararakum. I like that. Hararakum. I like that. Rolling R. Praise God. And you know what's that? Hararakum. Well, that's uh, make you free. Praise God. It says, uh, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Muslims, you need to know the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Yes. And if you will know that truth, you can be set free. You say, well, I don't want freedom. That's some kind of Western invention. Da, 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 da. No, you want freedom. You need freedom from the fact that one day you're going to be judged by Allah in your mind. And according to Surah al maryam chapter 19 of the Quran, you're going to go to hell. Every Muslim's going to go to hell. Even Muhammad probably would go to hell. Everyone's going to go to hell and taste the death, and the fire and the punishment of hell for some time. And whether or not Allah would pull you out is an open question. But I can tell you right now, he won't because you cannot go to heaven with your sins. Adam and Hoa, Adam and Eve could not remain in heaven with just one sin. Have you sinned at least once? How can you go to the heaven that Adam and Eve were kicked out of for one sin when you have thousands? There's no way. Your sins have to be paid for. They have to be wiped away. There's only there's no way to do that, is there? You can't wash yourself enough, do what do five times a day in water. It doesn't do the trick. As a matter of fact, if you pray five times a day, that's not going to cut it because if you go and you study the hadith when Muhammad supposedly uh, went up to paradise, Allah said you got to pray 50 times. Tell your followers to pray 50 times a day. If you're not praying 50 times a day, according to the religion of Islam, you're falling short. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, very clearly, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every human flesh, every human, except one. Now, who is that? Well, if you want to know who it is, it's clear in the Bible, but you can go to your own hadith. Sahih al-Bukhari says that when everyone is born, he is touched by Satan when he's in his mother's womb, except one. Now, you'd think that'd be Muhammad. Muhammad would be the golden boy. He didn't get touched by Satan. No, according to Sahih al-Bukhari, good old Bukhari, he says, uh, Jesus, the son of Mary, when Satan tried to touch him, he touched the placenta and said he, he couldn't quite get there. I don't understand these hadith or something else. But the point of the matter is, according to the hadith, the only person on the face of the earth, the only human is without sin or out original sin, this touch of Satan is Jesus. Guess what? That's what the Bible tells us, too. He uh, who knew no sin. He became sin so that we might become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. He was tempted uh, like everyone, and yet he was without sin. Even Pilate says, I find no fault in the man, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Jesus says, if you if you uh, abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's the truth of the gospel. And then he goes on, and, and, and they answer him, these Jews who believe in him. Hey, wait a minute. We're Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? Muslims say, we don't want freedom. Yes, you do. You want freedom from the judgment of God because you cannot stand up to God. God is much more holy than your Allah, much more holy than Muhammad. God is, is enthroned in majesty and splendor and light and beauty and love and perfect holiness and perfect power. And just to stand in his presence would be to burn up, to fall like a dead man on your face in the presence of a holy, all-consuming fire of a God. Who will be able to stand on that day when the Son of Man, who is the Son 
Son of God, who is Jesus the Messiah, not Isa, the, Isa al Messiah, is Jesus the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus, who is the Word in the beginning, with the Word and was God, that's Jesus Christ, hallelujah. He is going to judge you. God the Father is going to be on the throne. How will you stand? You cannot stand unless you be cleansed, and the only way you can be cleansed is through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not free yet. You need to be freed if you have not yet received Jesus Christ. He alone can free you. Jesus says, if you abide in my word and you're my disciples, indeed you shall know the truth. The truth shall be set, for shall set you free. The Jews who believed in him said, we are Abraham's descendants. Verse 33, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? Jesus answers in verse 34 of John chapter 8. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I love that. I love that. If the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. The son. Who is the son? The son of God. Because it's the house of God that we want to go to. It's heaven that we want to go to, the abode. And we can go if the son makes us free. And how does he make us free? He makes us free by us receiving the free gift. Yes, it says, for God so loved the world in John chapter 3, verse 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation is free. And once we are freed from the uh, fear of death, which uh, all our lifetime we're in bondage to, it says in Hebrews chapter 2, unless we've been freed from it, we're not free. And you see, we should be free now to say what we will. Jesus did not say, if anyone says something bad about me, go and kill him. Go and, and, uh, and you know, strike off his head. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, just the opposite. You find, I believe it's in the Gospel of Luke, where uh, his disciples are going through, they're going through Samaria, and there's a town of the Samaritans that refuse to receive Jesus. And they say, ah, Jesus, do you want us to uh, call down fire from heaven and burn him up like Elijah did? Jesus says, hey, wait a minute. You know not what spirit, what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy life, but to save it. You see, friends, Jesus Christ did not kill people for speaking their mind or for their choice of freedom of religion. Hillary Clinton, like Muhammad, will jail and impose restrictions and pursue and prosecute and persecute, I believe, Christians who wish to speak the truth about their religion in the public square and the truth about the falsehood of the religion of Islam in particular. Uh, in the public square. And it could even be, folks, that Hillary Clinton, if she becomes president, will do all that she can to end the ABN and the training channel. Now, Muslims, you know, you don't want that. Some of you drink coffee all night and you, you, you've got to watch our programs. If we go off the air, who are you going to watch? So Muslims, if you haven't voted yet, go vote for Trump so ABN and the training channel can stay on the air and uh, we can continue to get your calls and encourage you and pray for you. All right. Well, I'm so glad that you all tuned in to watch the cross and the crescent this evening. You know, the election is not over yet. Uh, we need to be praying. Let's be praying, folks. Uh, let's join in prayer. Why don't, why don't we end in prayer before we sign off, shall we? Let's pray for our nation and for the freedom that we do enjoy. And the freedom that we enjoy in the West truly has its foundation nowhere else except Jesus Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you right now asking you to have mercy on our nation. Oh, Lord God, there, there are 10,220,000 unborn lives that depend on this election. Lord God, please have mercy. Would you be pleased to put uh, Republicans in? This is my personal opinion and my personal prayer. And I say that because those are ones who follow this party, which says that uh, they are against abortion. They're against killing the unborn. Lord God, please have mercy. Bring in righteousness into our land. Lord, we pray that Obama in his last few months would have a change of heart and we get born again. We pray for Clinton, Lord, uh, whether she's president or not, that she would get born again if she's not. It doesn't seem that she is. Lord, we pray for Donald Trump that he would be born again. We pray for uh, Mr. Pence, Lord, it seems like he might be born again and that he would have a wonderful effect on Trump. Lord, if they would win the White House, that as he has said, 
that they would do what they could to overturn Roe versus Wade and to end the slaughter of millions of Americans. Lord, please have mercy on our land. It's so crucial, the Supreme Court, so crucial for the next several decades. Have mercy on our land, Lord God. Help people see that the liberal left in America and the radical Muslims, uh, are, there's very little difference between them. And that should tell us something, Lord. Open the eyes of our people to understand that the answer is found in Christ alone, who says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, I pray for Muslims tonight and others who don't know you, that you would free them right now, that they would believe upon you, that they would repent of their sins, ask for forgiveness, and ask Jesus Christ to come into their hearts and be the Lord of their lives, and ask the Holy Spirit to come, and to, that they would be born again that they could follow you all of their days. Lord, may you get the glory, the praise, and the honor now and forevermore. And we thank you in advance for your mercy being shed on this country, we pray. In Christ Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you all so much for watching our program. This is Pastor Joseph for the Cross and the Crescent, Trinity Channel on ABN. Look forward to seeing you right here, same time, next week. Until then, good night, and God bless you.